A few months ago, the tech industry was abuzz with speculation about which company would come out on top of the AI arms race. You know, Microsoft had partnered with OpenAI, Google had introduced Bard, and we knew that the DeepMind team was coming together with Project Gemini, and Meta just kept iterating on that really powerful llama model. But it turns out the narrative is changing, and I did not see this coming. It seems like whatever market forces are happening, it's forcing the big tech companies to actually come together and collaborate. You know, Meta ended up just actually open sourcing the Llama model so any of the open source communities could build on it. And that open source mentality actually led it to be on the Microsoft Cloud. Now you can go to Azure and run one of the Llama models. And one of the biggest players in China, Alibaba, is following Meta's lead in open sourcing some of their best models. And even the proprietary models that Microsoft, Google, OpenAI, and some of the other big tech companies are using have unbelievable access through APIs. They're definitely thinking of this as a platform move, not as a single product. And if you step back from those company-based decisions and you think about the power of large language models in the fact that their output is so versatile, it means that any output, even from a model like GPT that you're going on to somebody else's proprietary system for, can be output in such a specific way. It can be prompted in a way where you can train another model in a more optimal way than actually scanning the internet as a whole. And I know that seems sort of abstract, but that's like pulling the best part of somebody's brain like right out of their head to train another brain. That's really, really useful for all sorts of open source projects or people who want to compete with the big guys. So in this video, we're going to explore what this collaborative nature actually means for us. We are the people who collectively put all of the data onto the internet in the first place that these models were trained on and makes them so smart. So I have some questions about that. Like, do we deserve some of the money that's going to come from all of this integration? And in the long run, how important are the tech companies to the long-term implications of AI and humanity anyways? And should we be a little bit wary? Because if they're giving it away for free, that might mean that we're the product. Now, of course, Curious Future is a YouTube channel that's devoted to artificial intelligence, so I talk about it all the time, but let's think about whether or not the big tech companies actually care as much as I do. So let me start by saying that there's a big tech company that you have heard of, and their CEO just said, he's building artificial intelligence into, quote, every product. And that CEO is Tim Cook from Apple. Yes, the same CEO who during all the major presentations never uses the word artificial intelligence. Oh yeah, and the CEO of Microsoft, Satya Nandela, doesn't even need to say it because he's already put artificial intelligence into everything Microsoft does. Okay, actually, maybe why don't I focus on a tech company that you've heard of that isn't making artificial intelligence a top priority? Okay, let's see here. Uh, we could talk about IBM. Oh yeah, Watson X and their whole AI division. No, we can't talk about IBM. Maybe Salesforce? No, they're all AI. That's all they've been doing is talking about AI. Zoom? No, they just updated their terms of service so that they can use all Zoom calls as artificial intelligence training. NVIDIA? Of course not. Like now one of the trillion dollar companies because of all the AI demand and the best researchers around. Amazon. Oh, let's see what Andy JC said about the future of AI and Amazon. Every single Amazon team is working on generative AI, says the CEO. Okay, so I guess not Amazon. Okay, you know I'm playing around, but there's literally no company that doesn't have an AI first strategy. And the same thing goes for all the big tech companies in China. Here's the facts. The world is putting artificial intelligence first. It's going to come way faster than you think. And it's going to hit way harder than you think. And even if I'm a couple orders of magnitude off because I'm a YouTuber that wants to talk about AI all the time, it's still going to hit super hard in the next decade. Okay, so going from that premise that basically everybody is 100% bought into this idea of AI. Why is it that Meta, who's put billions of dollars into this, they have some of the best AI researchers, are dumping their models onto the internet for free, open source. Let's dive into the thinking around that kind of a decision. Open source products like AutoGPT, ChaosGPT, they're out there on the internet doing some sort of scary stuff recursively. Projects like WormGPT are actually made just to build malware and do phishing scams. Like, this sucks. And Llama 2 is going to make them smarter and better at doing those kind of nefarious things. But on the upside, when it comes to academia, some of these universities actually have enough money to take a Llama 2 model, use it for science, research, education, and they can build around it. Whereas if they were constantly tapping into an API like Microsoft's, they would be spending an arm and a leg and it wouldn't be cost efficient. It also allows interested researchers and students and regular people to just go around and play with it, tinker with it, try it in like some crazy idea and just see what it does. So the innovation is much faster. So Alibaba, the prominent e-commerce behemoth in China, made the announcement that they've also open sourced the weights, the parameters, 
everything involved with their large language model. And this strategic move is meant directly to compete with Meta's decision. So Alibaba's model is named Tongi Quan Win, and it's a large language model that's very comparable to Llama 1. It's a 7 billion parameter model, so it's a bit smaller than Llama 2 and quite a bit smaller than GPT-4, but it's still really powerful. It will be iterated on, and from its core, it's always been trained on both Chinese and English in a way that none of the American models are. It'll be interesting to see if they actually get so much traction with their model that people feel the need to host it on their cloud servers. Like, will we see Tongi Quan win on Azure, Google, IBM, and the Amazon Web Services cloud systems? Okay, so now let's talk about some of the data that all of these models are trained on, and like, who really gets some of the credit for this? And this is a tough one for me because we all put stuff on the internet, and it was trained on the stuff that it learned, but it doesn't seem like a copyright problem to me because it generates its own output. But the courts are going to decide on this. In fact, there are several class action lawsuits against Microsoft, OpenAI, and Google. Guys, I've got a metaphor for you. Imagine Google as some ambitious chef. Call him Bard, the chef named Bard, I guess. The class action lawsuit is saying that what this chef Bard has actually done with its secret recipe is just steal the entire internet, which isn't really a recipe. It's just stealing at a mass scale that's so grand that nobody else could compete with it. And the class action lawsuit has a number of defectors, people who came from some of the big tech companies and basically gave up the secret sauce. Like here's all of the data that we took and here's where it came from. So they're using that to turn this into a $5 billion lawsuit. That's how much the class action lawsuit wants from the big tech companies. And I guess they'll distribute that to everybody on the internet who contributed. I, I don't really know, but you know what? I'm gonna ask Claude to read all 70 pages of this lawsuit and answer that question for us right now. Because I should have done that while I'm scripting, but it's never too late. This is the only model that I know of that can handle a 100K context window, which is big enough to read that entire lawsuit. So this is the big class action lawsuit against Google. It is 90 pages. I'm gonna simply highlight the whole thing, copy and paste it into Claude 2. This is the only model that I know of that can handle a 100K context window, which is big enough to read that entire lawsuit. If the class action lawsuit is successful, who will the $5 billion be distributed to? Oh my God, that's insane. Look at how much text is in that little box right now. Okay, if the lawsuit is successful, the 5 billion in damages being sought would likely be distributed to the internet user class comprised of all persons in the United States whose personal information was accessed, collected, tracked, taken, or used by Google without consent. That's the whole internet. Like you mean everybody on social media would just get a piece of this $5 billion? I don't even know how they distribute that, but that would be interesting. It'd probably just be like everyone in the US, if you have a social security number, like sign up here and get like whatever, 300 bucks. Okay, so it wouldn't even be that much. It would be $15 each, I guess. $5 billion divided by the 330 million people in the US, and that's even before the fees go to the lawyers. And all persons in the US who own a US copyright in any work that was used as a trading set for Google products like Bard. Hmm. I don't know if that does it for me. It's like both not enough and too much in a weird way. So when it comes to scraping the internet, OpenAI now has a new web crawler. A web crawler is what you'd think. It's a bot that goes out there on the internet and makes a copy of the entire internet. It goes out there and scrapes every website. It's the same thing that powers google.com. And now OpenAI, who creates ChatGPT, has their own web scraper. So if you've wondered why ChatGPT for a while didn't have any access to the internet, then it could go out and search the internet, and then they took that away. This is why, because when it comes back eventually, it's gonna be because OpenAI had to go out there and scrape the entire internet themselves, and they had to make a bot that was specific and it stopped bringing in information that was copyrighted or behind a paywall. People were using ChatGPT to get access to articles that they were not supposed to be able to get access to. So it's an interesting move because now they're gonna remove personal data, content that contradicts the OpenAI guidelines, and most importantly, because they don't wanna get sued into oblivion, stuff that's behind a paywall. And this seems like a big ambitious thing to tackle, but they've already put a patent out for the new GPT-5 trademark. So it must be about getting that next big iteration out there in a big way that they can defend. Now, another thought that I got when I was reading this article is maybe the future version of GPT like GPT-5 won't have like a cutoff date, but maybe the next model will have a cutoff date. And then also there'll be some kind of a web crawler that's out there constantly getting new information. It's always aware of what it knows and what it's seen already in the data set and what's 
new information. And maybe there's a smaller model that's constantly updated. So the big model says, ooh, let me check if anything in the smaller model has happened that I'm not aware of. And then it can kind of combine the two in a way that feels more real time. So, so far in the video, we've explored why is there so much collaboration between the big tech companies? Why are they willing to open source these products so anybody can use them? Why are they going to such an extent to make the platforms accessible to all of us through APIs? There is one answer to that, and that's because we are the product. Whenever anything's too good to be true, there's a catch, and there's a catch here. We are the product. You and I have something that all of these AI models need, and that is to learn from our human intelligence. What all the tech companies are trying to do is get their model in the hands of real people, find a way to get that feedback back into their next model so their model can iterate towards a human-like intelligence. The more human-like it is, the more capable it is, the more opportunities these tech companies will have to make money. And the biggest winner is gonna be the one that positions themselves with the most humans giving it data the most human feedback. They want quality, they want quantity, they want diversity, they want all of your life, basically. So starting from Meta's point of view, they look at Microsoft and they see OpenAI with the most advanced large language model in the world. An incredible data source and partner with Microsoft, who remember has the Bing search engine, which has indexed the entire internet. They have the second best cloud servers in the world with Azure. And they're just one step ahead of everybody else right now. They integrated so quickly, they came out of the gate so hot. Then they look at Google, they know DeepMind traditionally has been the leader. They know that the data source that they're getting from Google.com and YouTube is actually even better than what they're getting from Facebook.com. And even though they have a lot of great scientists, they don't quite have the same level that Demis has over at DeepMind. So their strategy is to open source. When you're kind of in that third place position, why not get the community on your side? From Microsoft's point of view, they want to keep their lead. They know that Google could be hot on their tails. They know that they don't have as good of a data source as Google does but they have first mover advantage. So it's about quickly getting the products in front of people so they get addicted to it as fast as possible. And then for Google, it's about making sure that generative AI shows up immediately on google.com and that they have a data source that's giving them better feedback than anybody else. And they're using that to improve their model faster. Their goal is iterative. And that's why they have Project Gemini where they brought together all of their AI researchers who used to work disconnected into one project. And they need to start tapping into everything they know from Google Docs and all of their other tools and their good Will and their Gmail system and the two most visited websites in the world. But even though there's this evolving dynamics and everybody's trying to position themselves where they think they have the advantage, at the end of the day, they all need us because we are the product. So if you like these tech industry deep dives into how the big companies are positioning themselves around artificial intelligence, help me get to 6,000 subscribers on this YouTube channel by smashing that subscribe button and I will see you in the next video.